Hello, I'm Kate Fitzgerald from the Learning Hack team, welcoming you to a new episode of Great Minds on Learning. In this highly acclaimed series, Professor Donald Clark, internationally famous author, blogger and entrepreneur, joins John Helmer to explore two and a half thousand years of thought and theorising about learning from the Greeks to the geeks. Why is education the way it is? Why does the bell ring to signal the end of a lesson? Who invented teacher training? Why do universities combine teaching with research? It might surprise you to learn that the answers to these questions can be found in the writings of early 19th century German philosophers. This episode looks at the German idealists, a group including Kant and Hegel inspired by the Enlightenment and the spirit of Romanticism following the French Revolution, who set the mould of the education systems of today. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Great Minds on Learning about the German idealists. I'm here with my co-host, Donald Clark, as usual. We're dealing this time with two of the absolute big beasts of German philosophy and two of the most difficult to read, Kant and Hegel. And luckily, that's Donald's job, not mine. Both had something to say about learning, though both are more widely known for areas of their thought, more associated with history, politics, theology, and, of course, philosophy. The other two theorists, uh, Herbart and von Humboldt, might be less well known, but I think I can guarantee that by the end of this episode, you will be amazed by how much of what we currently accept as normative in education can be found in the writings of these four individuals. So, Donald, could you kick off by giving us an introductory overview to the German idealists? And I think it's worth pointing out up front for the benefit of those who haven't studied the subject that some of the terms used in philosophy have meanings specific to itself, don't always correspond with the way those words are used in common parlance. So transcendentalism, for instance, in this context, isn't all about paisley pattern caftans and caftans and hallucinogenic drugs. <laughs> Idealism, likewise, is about a bit more than just hoping for a better world. But Donald, with your talent for making difficult subjects not only understandable but compelling, I'm sure you'll be an able guide. So why this group of thinkers? Yeah, well, the why is an interesting question. And the why the why is astonishing, really, because most we've all had our lives massively shaped by this group of people, even though we be may be totally unaware of the fact, because the education system across the West and the one that actually spread around the globe actually is Prussian and came from this intellectual group. You might call them the German idealists. Uh, there, there were a lot more than the four we're going to be looking at today. You know, you got all sorts of weird names in there. There's we're going to be there's Hegel, Hegel, Schlegel, Schelling, Fichte, Schopenhauer, all those people. But uh, as you rightly said, we'll be looking at the four I think that really have, in a sense, directly shaped us, and who really did reflect somewhat on the role of education in their philosophical systems and the state. But basically, the bottom line is the schooling system as we know it. Uh, and the university system, terribly important as well. The whole notion of compulsory education in the West or mandatory schooling has its direct roots in the Prussian system. So uh, essentially what happened was that (laughs) the the Prussians were defeated by Napoleon and the Prussians said, we better get our act together and really shape the schooling around the military principles. So it's not just compulsory education for everyone, it's also the idea that you have massive state control. This is something that comes out of Hegel and all sorts of thinkers in Germany at the time. The state has a huge role to play here. The state sets the curriculum. The state sets the standards, uh, ensures that everybody complies to those curricula and standards and maintains overall control in the whole thing. And then the setting of grades, standardized testing according to age, right out of the Prussian system. And then I think that very slightly, and that's character and civic, the sort of character education which came through Coburg, which I really, really don't like very much, came right into the public school system in England and gets resurrected every time there's a right-wing government gets elected. Of course, every few years you get character education pumped back in through the civil service. No evidence that it works whatsoever. And then another interesting one, the way we've all been affected, walk into a school or a university, they are the most hierarchical institutions and Mm -hmm. organisations you know, university with its whole professorship, lecturers, you know, assistant lecturers and so on, massively hierarchical. 
That's the Prussian system. That's exactly what it is. The whole notion of degrees, PhDs, postgraduate degrees, and so on. All of that, the masters, everything out of Prussia. And you go into school even, you know, you're a senior leadership team, heads of department, very hierarchical. They even rank universities in official ranks. You never see that in the corporate sector. So I think all of this has its deep Prussian roots. So we're all Prussians at heart, really. That's why these people are important, I suppose. Yeah, itchy. That's great. That's given us a good foundation and also some of the themes that uh, are going to come up through these people. One of yeah. them being Napoleon, which is interesting. Yeah. We're kind of coming out of the Enlightenment, and most of these are sitting in the Romantic era, yeah. which, which might seem strange, you know. It is, yeah. They are directly with, linked to Romanticism. But, but yeah, very, very important, that, that timing, as we'll see. So should we dive in? Sure thing. Yeah, let's go. Immanuel Kant. 1724 to 1804. Immanuel Kant was a German philosopher and one of the central Enlightenment thinkers, born in Königsberg and stayed there all his life, never married. People used to make fun of people like that. Funny he never married. Very often that was code for the fact they're okay. Kant's comprehensive and systematic works in epistemology, metaphysics, ethics, and aesthetics have made him one of the most influential and controversial figures in modern Western philosophy, and he's famously difficult to read. In his doctrine of transcendental idealism, Kant argued space and time are mere forms of intuition that structure all experience and that the objects of experience are mere appearances. Now, this is all also framed, I think, as a distinction between the numinous world and the phenomenological world. Experience is the appearance of reality we can't directly know. So we can't, there, there's a, a German phrase for this that the, the Ding and sich, was it, Donald? That's right, Ding and sich, thing in itself. The thing in itself. We can't yeah. know the thing in itself. We only know appearances. So he was influenced by Rousseau, who we covered back in episode six, and like other Enlightenment thinkers, was a big advocate of reason with a capital R. A lot of capital letter uh, words in this. When it came to education, he believed, Kant believed, discipline must be applied to restrain the natural impulses of children, which are basically to mess about. Education is about structure, schedule, and strictness imposed by parents and teachers upon naturally unruly children. As a parent, I can get behind the idea of children being in a Hobbesian state of nature, i.e. nasty, brutish, and short. Well, I have to say, all mine were lovely. <laughs> Kant was very much opposed to David Hume who we've only covered in passing as being roundly mistreated by Rousseau, but has been an important figure in the background of a lot of these episodes. Kant thought that morality comes from, a reason, comes from reason and not, as Hume claimed, from sentiment. Donald, I know you're a fan of Hume as the great empiricist. In your blog about Kant, you do a great job of not letting that turn you completely against him. But how do you assess Kant's writing about learning? How important is he in that context? Yeah. I assume that Kant is one of those words that uh, you referred to earlier that means something different in the real world. I'm glad you got the pronunciation right there, John. <laughs> it's a difficult <laughs> one, that. Yeah. <laughs> but he, yeah, Kant, Kant was in very much a, a reaction against Hume. In fact, what the what he was was an attempt to reconcile two things: the empiricism of British empiricism, people like Locke and Hume and rationalism. So he tried to bring those two worlds together, which he does in a system. Whether you believe that system is another question. I'm more of a Hume fan in terms of moral philosophy and metaphysics. Uh, I think Hume was uh, the by far the, the superior philosopher and thinker. Nevertheless, Kant has this central position uh, in having this sort of Copernican reversal. In other words, the individual, the role of the mind, we, the mind imposes space and time upon reality, very opposite of Hume. Hume thought that everything came through the senses, uh, 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 which is the equal and opposite, as it were. But you're right, he spent all his time as a sort of loner in Konigsberg. I think somebody once said he had never ventured more than a mile from the place he was born for his whole life, you know, never went anywhere. Uh, yeah. But he did, interestingly, putting his philosophy to one side, although his education is really deep-rooted in his philosophy, he did indeed write about education. Not so much directly. It turns out that the book he wrote, Lectures on Education, were bits and bobs from all his other writings. Nevertheless, you're right. He was influenced by Rousseau. 
a, and the, and one book in particular which he refers to a lot and that's uh, that's a meal in the lectures on education you see a meal come up all the time and that's because a bit like Rousseau he thought that people intrinsically had this almost innate unconditional morality which they imposed upon the world or came to the world with and that reason comes into play because you simply universalize moral principles and then we all obey those rules so it's that sort of deontological rule-driven view of the world the universalization of principles the golden mean and so on and this morality is a really important thing comes from reason and not as my great hero claimed from sentiment and feeling now i think that's just plainly wrong I think that we are we are evolved beings and that when we make moral judgments, I am like Hume and Height and all sorts of really contemporary commentators in this, believe that our mor moral views and, and beliefs actually are deeply rooted in our feelings about something, our feelings of sympathy, empathy, and so on and so forth. Uh, Hume's absolutely spot on here. Kant was, I think, completely wrong. So the child, a child, in a sense, for Kant, comes to the world with a sort of moral view of the world, which I, I, I just think is is rather odd, or a rational moral view of the world that we need to nurture through education. That was the root of this for Kant. So schooling becomes this necessary thing because you're giving, uh, you're you're putting the child in the peer group, an age level peer group. Uh, where he's picking up reason from other children as well. They're developing a social moral outlook together, but it's always got this purpose. It's always got this goal and aim, and that aim is always a sort of moral outlook. So education for Kant, and generally in this group of Germans, is deeply rooted in morals and character. It's very different from how mo many people would see it to today, but it's still there in, a, in the ways we teach in higher education that we'll come to. For, for Kant also, I mean, he had no children and so on, and it was all about obedience. You know, we can't let these kids muck about and have fun. Uh, it's all about structure, schedule, curriculum, strictness, uh, you know. And also that notion that schools are, more, are responsible for the moral upbringing of children more than their parents, which is an interesting view. Mm. And I think that's still a strong belief in compulsory state education now that teachers really matter and parents are a rather annoying peripheral. <laughs> hmm. I found that when I, I was a governor in the school, parents were looked upon with some disdain. But I think that's an important thing that's carried through in this system. So he's against that molly coddling type view of the world, you know, uh, kids didn't give, give them too much to play. I like, like Plato, interestingly, he didn't believe that kids should be reading fiction. I thought that was, yeah. I always find this fascinating. But they were they have very good arguments for this, I should add. It's not as simple and stupid and dogmatic as you might imagine. Uh, but he did like the Socratic method of instruction. That's important as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, education is this moral civilization, civilizing thing uh, to, to, to bring to, together people as a group within society, a very German view of the world, I think, S that single notion of humanity, reason, uh, and, uh, you know, that notion of progress. This all comes out of the Enlightenment, of course, but uh, the, the streak of romanticism is in there as well. There are others in the here, like Schelling and so on, who who actually brought another thing into education in Fichte, which is the importance of uh, literature and a critical view of literature. So we find that our university systems are still chock-a-block with students critiquing texts. Mm. You know, so you still send your kid to school at five and you come out 25, do a master's, whatever, and they're still writing essays and critiquing text. Critical thinking is very often that and that only. That's very, very strong German idea rooted in Kant and some of the other people we'll discuss. Yeah, very bookish people here. Very bookish, so yeah, exactly. Uh, you wouldn't get any more anyone more bookish than Kant. <laughs> well, maybe uh, Herbert, the next one, he, he was quite bookish as well. But while we while we're still on Kant, like, how how influential was he? Well, the big his his influence, of course, was in the, some of the people because he was he was really a precursor to the Romantics, rather uh, to the uh, German idealists, but the real philosophical root of it all. Mm. Uh, but his influence, I mean, uh, John Dewey, for example, his PhD thesis was on Immanuel Kant. <laughs> interestingly and so uh, John Dewey often talks about Kant and, and, and views expressed by Kant in philosophy and education because Dewey was a half philosopher half psychologist really 
So his influence was very strong, much more, much stronger in the US than in the UK, because our tradition was still firmly rooted in that sort of British empiricism coming through in the 19th century through Bentham and Mill and utilitarianism. You know, we were much more so Anglo-Saxon and practical about the world rather than idealist, uh, believing that there was this transcendental world that we couldn't get to grips with. We were much more rooted, much more quickly into science and realism and empiricism. Hmm. So, how so, did Kant's, you know, sorry. so how did Kant's ideas translate into practical reality? I mean, what, what did he say about the organisation of schools and education? That yeah, well, stuck? of course, Kant, Kant's really an indirect influence on some of the other people we're going to speak to uh, okay. speak about now. So he's earlier, you know, Kant dies in the early, uh, he, he, I think it's 1804, 1802, 1804, so really early on. The others then have their careers after his death, but every single one of them would have studied and indeed admired and picked up on the on Kantian ideas. It was the intellectual context of mm. German philosophy in the, uh, for, uh, for the whole of the 19th century. So if you move on to uh, some, a uh, if you look if you look at the next person, that's Herbert. Segue quite nicely into that. He studied he studied Kant and was a pupil of Fichte, who's also a Kantian figure in here. He also talked about education, but in a peripheral sense. But these people directly studied Kant, and uh, yeah. Yeah, well, so one we, of the we, things I noticed when doing my research, which mainly involved watching YouTube, was <laughs> that. Um, there seemed a real theme with Kant and then with Hegel and the others that they they gave people problems that you know people were dealing with the problems that Kant raised and then yeah. similarly with Hegel and and you know you say we're still dealing with 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 those problems but it it seemed to be become the job of philosophers to raise questions and problems for the next generation and in fact I've I've seen it said as well that Kant was the first one of the first real academic philosophers that the in the 18th century, his predecessors hadn't been, you, you know, it wasn't assumed that a philosopher would be working in a university. Yeah. And after the 19th century, either it was really in the 20th century, you get the the thing we now think of as normative, that a philosopher lives in a university, which is interesting. And so he was professional, right. and his professional job was to provide problems for, for philosophers who came after him. I think that's right. It's interesting that many of the most successful philosophers throughout the 19th, 20th century, century even in Germany, people like Nietzsche and some were not academics and weren't yeah. bound by academia. And those that were tended to be those who came up with these incredibly complicated system views of the world. Uh, but that's an interesting observation. And I think you're right. It is it is very academic. And I think that shines through in the view of education. What they wanted to do was funnel everybody towards the university system, which is still exactly what we do today. You know, the whole of secondary education is really geared towards producing kids that go into universities. We've, we sort of almost selectively dump the other half and forget about them. And we've, and another feature of the Prussian system was to diminish and uh, set aside vocational learning. And boy, has that, have we stuck to that system? Mm. So I think that academic, bookish, rational view, text based view of the world is exactly what we're talking about here with regard to the massive influence of the Prussian system. And mm -hmm. Herbert carried this through. Uh, out, out, you know, Kant didn't really have much direct influence on education other than through Dewey, but Herbert certainly did. And of course, Humboldt just absolutely shaped the whole system. So let's move on to our next theorist, who is... Johann Friedrich Herbert, 1776 to 1841. Uh, Johann Friedrich Herbert was a German philosopher, psychologist, and the founder of pedagogy as an academic discipline. He invented teacher training, well, so that every teacher had to learn Piaget, although Piaget, of course, wasn't born then. That's a pretty big thing to have on your CV, and I'm now slightly embarrassed, in fact, I've never heard of him before researching this episode. He was born in Oldenburg, northern Germany, homeschooled by his mother till the age of 12, studied Kant and was a pupil of Fichte, another important thinker in the story of German idealism. Um, his interest in educational reform began with a private tutoring job. In 1809, he took up the chair formerly held by Kant in Königsberg. Here he established a seminary of pedagogy. It's been said that 
He barely saw the world outside his study in the classrooms. And it's tempting to compare him to Kant. But apparently, contrary to what you say there, Donald, um, I, I've seen somebody else say that apparently Kant was actually very sociable, although he'd never married and lived alone, and was a witty and voluble dinner guest. Herbert is now remembered among the post-Kantian philosophers mostly as making the greatest contrast to Hegel, in particular in relation to aesthetics, but also, I suspect, in his educational philosophy, which is known as Her Herbartianism, I think. Yeah. I think I've got that right. Donald, can you tell us about Herbartianism? Yeah, Herbert. Uh, yeah. His educational philosophy, and that will set us up well for the contrast with Hegel. Yeah, the Herbartian thing. I mean, there was a Herbert Society, which is massively influential in the States. Again, you find lots of this. It swung out into the United States, then yeah, back into Europe again. And that was true of Herbert as well. Uh, so I say he studies Kant, you know, and Fichte. He's embedded in the German idealist tradition philosophically. But he was very practical. And you're absolutely right there. Invented teacher training. Of course, we don't think about this. You assume it always was there. But mm. actually, before Herbert, it it just didn't exist. So he brings that into the Prussian system, if you want to call it that. We'll call it, loosely call it that. Well, let's call that a bit later. Uh, and he brings pedagogy, and he believes that learning science matters, the subject of all our podcasts, John. So, yeah. so he, pump, he injects these two things, the psychology of learning, really, is, is what, his, what his main interest was. But again, uh, in his books, he has his very famous book called The General Education that public, published after his death, was massively popular. Hugely popular in the 19th century. And again, a, a really interesting thing, though, is although he picked up in all those things I mentioned at the beginning, state-sponsored education, education for all, age-driven, ranked education, he did think that education should be apolitical uh, and not actually under the control of the state. And that was to do with the emerging views of democracy and so on uh, at the time, you know, the, the idea that uh, people should be should be able to think for themselves. And the individual for Herbert was terribly important. You're developing individuals in the educational system. You're developing their ability to reason, giving them skills and maths, languages and so on. But you're also on top of that moral character, never forget moral character. They all go on about moral character all the time in this in their literature. Uh, so that, but the individual is the important thing here. Now, the development of character is the really big one in Her Herbert because he really pumps this into the system. And, and character is producing an individual that is capable enough to go out and be autonomous in the real world, financially, in terms of employment, in terms of having a family, in terms of looking after themselves and their own health. It's a Greek ideal, really, of the good life. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, this is the Kantian influence here, because Kant also believed that moral character was the one dimension that lay at the core of all educational endeavor. Yeah. There's, this, there's another weird thing, in, if, you, if you've read this stuff, and I did a lot of reading in, in German philosophy way back in the day, you find a really weird word popping up, and that's will or will. will. So you've got Schopenhauer, uh, which is the, the will and representation, two big volumes by him. You have Nietzsche, who believed very strongly in this concept of the will, a sort of striving. So there are philosophical concepts that lie beneath all this, but on the moral dimension is the big one, character. The teacher teacher training is really interesting though because it, he really did go to town in that one. He thought it would be it should be absolutely it should be schools for teacher training be they get taught in the universities, which is still the case today, and it should be based on good learning science. So the whole teacher training thing is still around, two hundred and twenty years later. But this is the guy who started it all. That that's his big big legacy. And his most famous work is in in the realm of education, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. They, unlike Kant, uh, yeah. this was he, de he dedicated his whole life to this. Uh, so you know, the, the, and and really, he, he gave shape, as it were, to the Kantian intent, <laughs> practically in terms of learning science pedagogy, as you rightly said, which strictly means science of teaching. But he generally meant how people learn, how and therefore how should we teach them. And the Herbert Society in the U.S. was big, you know, and influenced schooling in the U.S. for for many, many decades. These are sort of forgotten figures, but that's uh, that's only because education doesn't get the big billing that philosophy does. So we're, we know Kant and Hegel, but we don't know Herbert, perhaps, or, or Humboldt. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And, and to 
Well, at an earlier point you mentioned there about morality and how important that was for, for these people, you know, we had to perhaps remind ourselves that these people are all working within a Christian tradition. Yeah. Um, and al although they're kind of taking on board the influence of the natural sciences, which, which is a big thing. I mean, you know, even pre-Darwin, science was beginning to pose a bit of a challenge to religion. Yeah. Kant, in a way, was uh, rephrasing Christian ethics um, yeah. within the terms of reason and and, and science. So they, they, they were kind right. of keeping Christianity alive in a way, and I think the same is true of, of Hegel as well. Yeah, yeah, these are Northern German figures, so they're in the post-Reformation world, you know, uh, and that part of the world took the Reformation very, very seriously indeed. That's where it started. And uh, and that's the context they're working in. But they're, these, these, are, these are extremely sophisticated philosophical minds and therefore, uh, you know, not, not religious or dogmatic in any sense whatsoever. They wanted a rational explanation for the world, not a God-given view of the world. Uh, but you're right, it's still... A religion is still a big part of schooling, certainly had not been put out. Interestingly, Herbert was not wholly secular in his views of what schooling were, but when you take the state out of schools, he didn't think, in other words, the state should not set the curriculum, was his view. Mm. Then, then you get less religious control because the state, of course, at that time was linked to the monarchy. And uh, so you do get a distance, distancing from religion, but not in the, it's certainly not secular. Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, to give him his full name, 1770 to 1831. There was only one man who ever understood me, and even he didn't understand me. These were the reputed last words of our next theorist, giant of philosophy, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, and people have been not understanding him ever since. Born in Stuttgart, at that time part of the Holy Roman Empire, he entered a Protestant seminary at 18, where his roommates were the poet Hölderlin, and another famous philosopher, Schelling. They were all three of them enthused by the outbreak of the French Revolution. Bliss was it in that hour to be alive and to be young. Uh, it was very heaven, as Wordsworth wrote at the same time. Ever after, Hegel drank a toast to the storming of the Bastille on the 14th of July, even after he'd been sort of disabused of his um, early enthusiasm for, for, for the revolution. He still clove to the spirit of 1789. That's the right date. But then don't we all, don't we all make that toast, Donald? He worked as a private tutor, an unpaid lecturer, a newspaper editor, which, which was a surprise to me, and also a headmaster before finally achieving paid posts at the University of Heidelberg and then Berlin, where he eventually died. I mean, it's quite a disrupted life because um, when he was writing one of his first works, uh, he, he was in Jena. And Napoleon was attacking Jena. Napoleon, who'd been his hero, came and kind of rolled over his town, which must have been a bit difficult. So th th this is a theme with all the intellectuals of that age, this generation uh, uh, at that time in Europe. There was initial enthusiasm for the revolution uh, until it came to their doorstep. And then you had the terror and so on to put a lot of people off. If you've encountered Francis Fukuyama's book, The End of History, or any Marxist thinkers at all, uh, you would have come across Hegel. And full disclosure, that's how I came to know about him. So it's a pleasure to find out a little more and fill in some gaps. But as it turns out, there's a lot of gap because Hegel is huge. His influence extends across the entire range of contemporary philosophical topics, from metaphysical issues in epistemology and ontology, to political philosophy, the philosophy of history, philosophy of art, he was big on aesthetics, philosophy of religion, of course, um, in the early years in the seminary, and the history of philosophy. Like Kant, he's notoriously difficult to understand. Perhaps that's why his work is open to such divergent in interpretations. He gets the blame for Marx, but there are also right-wing readings of Hegel that go in a different direction, though some would say that they both end up in the same place. Popper blamed him for both Marxism and fascism. Mm -hmm. Isaiah Berlin saw Hegel as an architect of authoritarianism in opposition to liberal democracy. Donald, when I read his views on education specifically, I got a shock because I'd expected to find him on the progressive side of things. Not sure why. And he's really quite the opposite, isn't he? I mean, as a headmaster, yeah. he must have been the demon headmaster, if anybody remembers that 90s 
children's TV series. So yeah. what do you make of Hegel in this context? Well, you're absolutely right. The, I mean, it was interesting listening to you, to, to you speak there and his love of the French Revolution, but there's perhaps no single individual in history that caused so much pain and suffering inadvertently. This was not him personally, but his influence on Marx, which led, of course, to Lenin, Stalin, Mao Zedong, the Cultural Revolution, the murder of tens, of, if not hundreds of millions of people, only ended in the 1970s with Paul Pot eliminating one third of the population of his country on the back of dialectical materialism. That was you, you, you slice people up into groups and eliminate the other half, them being the the enemy. Yeah. Uh, and I think we're still living with that in some of the thoughts that we are floating around today. So, but going back to Hegel, <laughs> Hegel himself, inc unbelievably opaque to try and read. I don't think I ever, I think he was right. I, if only one person understood him, I certainly didn't when I tried. Uh, and Popper, Bertrand Russell was extremely suspicious of Hegel, thought he was uh, really just toying with language rather than coming up with real philosophical depth. But most people would say he's a man of uh, great intellect. But he was a teacher, coming back to education. So he has this background in, as a headmaster, actually teaching, being a tutor and so on, which I think is really interesting because he did write about education. And he had this Kantian, Herbartian, German idealist view of the very strict and supervised state-driven education of a child. You know, where the state, in a sense, plays this huge role because you're trying to mold. This is to do with Hegel's view of history, that the state unfolds history uh, in a way that a histor any Marxist historicist would tell you. It turned out not to be true, of course, and turned out to be brutal and horrible uh, in both fascism and communism. Nevertheless, you're trying to mold the learner into civil society. That's fine. It, but what if your civil society happens to be National Socialism in 1930s Germany or the Cultural Revolution in China? Uh, and there's the big flaw in this view, this, this historicist view, which is why Popper criticised him so severely in the open society and his enemies, along with Plato as well. But education... I mean, education is a serious business uh, for Hegel, Hegel because you're always unfolding the person to play a role in the state. And he wants to get rid of fun, rid of, rid, rid of that notion that the, the child actually is important or the learner is important. Actually, they have to have that all bashed out to them. Uh, they have no intrinsic sense of morality. Uh, they have to be taught this stuff. All they have are childish impulses, which is why discipline is so important for Hegel. You know, he was well in favor of thrashing things at the kids. Uh, beyond that, of course, you have that notion of individuality that we find in Herbert. That was true in Hegel as well, and true of German idealism as a whole. Uh, there was no time for this discovery learning or letting letting kids develop on their own through play or fun in any sense. Teachers were instructors. And their role was to shape and mold the character and the intellectual development of a child, no matter what the views of that child. So there would be an application of a, an instruction, a direct instruction, really. And there's no, there are no critical thinkers or free learning, free thinking learners in Hegel's world. Yeah. And there's a very, a very important German word here, Bildung, which is the notion of imposing the social order, the internalization of a social order in a person. You know, building this formative development through learning, through education, is that what is that which you have to instill in the person. They don't come with this. You have to teach them it. Uh, the problem with this is it what becomes a system of complete conformity. And to be honest, I'm not so convinced that today's educational systems are that far from this. Uh, the sort of conformist thinking, I, 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 I sort of witness to this day in the education system, it sort of worries me because I think it, once you do reading in this area, you find that it was there 200 years ago and hasn't really grown, grown out of that. But it's quite in quite an extreme form in Hegel, isn't it? I mean, it is. You know, we, we, we might sort of scoff at discovery learning and the idea that people have to, kids have to yeah. learn for themselves, that, that the knowledge comes out of them. On the other hand, um, Hegel kind of said that it, it, 
seem to say from what I could read from your blog that um, it, that it, it, pupils could have no opinion about what they learned right. because all this yeah. stuff had been been very painfully kind of learned and gone through in the dialectic, you know, um, era after era to discover what we now know. Yeah. Uh, and actually, as a child, your job is you've got to know all that stuff before you can dare to have an opinion about it. Yeah. Um, and I just wonder, can you? There's a real reductio absurdum to that that nobody ever yeah. gets to have an opinion about every and unless they've got as much information um, at their fingertips as, say, Chat GPT. You know, in other words, you'd have to know everything yeah. that anybody and everybody had ever said before you're allowed to even kind of offer an opinion on on anything well, it seemed incredibly it, harsh and buttoned down and unpleasant yeah unlike Kant who admired and quoted Rousseau often Hegel quite literally <laughs> burned Hegel to the ground and, uh, Rousseau to the ground had no time for the Rousseauan view mm. of the world uh, and actually saw the book Emile uh, which Kant admired as almost ridiculous a ridiculous text uh, but you also have to remember that if you're addicted to reason and you believe that children don't develop reason until they're a good bit older or don't develop moral character until they're older, then you have quite a dismissive view of them being little critical thinkers when they're young. And there's some truth in this, to be honest. You know, it's not wholly ridiculous. The idea that people uh, should just be taught, you know, the arts and critical thinking from the age of three is okay. But if you don't have any knowledge or domain knowledge to build upon, it can be a rather fruitless sort of wandering task. And so, you know, as, as someone who's neither a traditionalist nor a progressive in education, I, I think there are some good things about this, the recognition that children need base knowledge and understanding of a topic to be able to critically think about it. On the other hand, uh, one can take this too far, and then you suddenly find that you've, your kid has spent 20 odd years just sitting in a lecture hall in a classroom discussing text. And oh, by the way, you have to do a master's now and you've got to stay until you're 25 or whatever age it is people come out of university these days. But for Hegel, Hegel, Hegel remember the context here as well because he was a bit Hobbesian. You know, he, he he did believe, he was known as a sort of a admirer, of course, of Frederick Wohn, whatever his name was, the third at the time in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, the state, the sovereign were incredibly important at that time in Germany and he was an apologist for that. So... Uh, it, it would be similar to the Hobbes, Hobbesian view of the world, the, the Leviathan view of the world, that people are brutish, warlike, and they just squabble with each other unless you have a society that has rules and law and order. And mm -hmm. that's terribly important for Hegel. He thought he had uncovered a sort of deep-rooted form of order, a sort of dialectical view of the world that where history unfolds, not in an entirely predictable manner, but certainly according to those rules. This turns yeah. out to be completely and utterly wrong, of course, because his uh, historicism has had its day in many ways. But yeah. so I, I've labored that a little bit because your question was right there. What, how, why did this happen? Well, if you really understand his basic philosophy, that whole notion of absolute reason, the logic of an unfolding history, then you can see why kids are not allowed any room to breathe when they're young. They have yeah. to be inculcated. Now, there's an interesting thing here. I think it still exists. If you look at the big influences of Hegel, dialectical materialism, through Marx, through Soviet Russia, into China, who are the countries who still impose re-education upon people? North Korea, and more importantly, China. So the Uyghurs are sitting, as we speak now, being re-educated out of their culture and religion. And so it's still a living thing in education. You know, tend to think education is just what our kids in our schools do, but there are tens of thousands of people in China being re-educated in a compulsory fashion according to the Hegelian method, in a sense, mm -hmm. and getting the hell, you know, their basic individuality knocked out of them because the state believes they should be going in this direction and not that direction. So, it's, yeah. Isn't part of the problem that Hegel believes not only that the, the human beings as as a subject, as you know, everybody ever born, that the, the human race is yeah. not only improvable, but perfectible. Yes. In other words, he's got this, he he's kind of smuggled back in Christian eschatology, the kind of the, the end of the world, that we're kind of progressing to a point where 
you know, as the human race learns more about itself and more about the, the world, it gets more and more power. And as it grows in knowledge and power and, 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 and all the rest of it, it eventually becomes so powerful through the operation of the dialectic that it um, comes close to God. And, and then you get the end of times. Um, so yeah. you know, we're, we're headed towards this kind of perfect uh, utopian end where where man is kind of is a god and in fact it was hegel not nietzsche who said god is dead for the first time yeah that was brilliant sean <laughs> <laughs> i absolutely agree with that analysis there i just finished a book by john gray uh, called the new leviathans which grew really about hobbes but also about hegel yeah. and he makes exactly the same point he, he actually says that we're living now also in a almost a sort of resurrection of this you know Miller and Minolarian eschatology. The words Eschat are all horrible, but they yeah, are horrible. Yeah, the eschatological and end of days view of the world, which is certainly I hear it commonly expressed amongst young people now. Yeah, you hear about you hear it in the AI debate. You know about AI being the end of the world. I'm looking out the window, going, "How on earth is a chatbot going to destroy the species?" Nevertheless, it seems massively exaggerated. Now, John Gray says this has become the cultural norm today, mm. uh, that actually most young people sort of buy into this yeah. uh, because we're faced with these existential problems like climate change and so on and so forth. But he believes the root of all that has nothing to do with Marx uh, uh, or Foucault or, or postmodernism. He, he, he joyfully says, I, you know, he's yet to meet somebody any any person who expresses these views who actually read Foucault or certainly not Derrida, who would actually truly understand what Derrida said, you wouldn't believe this. And neither have any of them got the depth of analysis and rigor of Marx. Mm. Actually, what it is is a resurrection of a sort of Christian idea of the weak shall inherit the earth and will fight, even if you have to sacrifice everything, you know, to overcome mm. the powerful because everyone's oppressed and that we must look for oppression everywhere. That was really what you were saying. I'm, I'm yeah. I, well, I, I think it's interesting as well that you get it on, you know, not only from the left, but but on the right. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, kind of free market libertarians um, have an eschatology in a sense that when finally we can get rid of the government and unstick its hands from around our throats, you know, yeah. uh, and there is no government and it's just kind of pure monetarism, then we will all kind of, be, become completely free, um, actualized individuals, and will be at the end of the world, as it were, you know, in, in a state of perfection. And every ideology that has, uh, every, every extreme ideology, I should say, seems to have an eschatology that the world, will, the, end of, the end is nigh. We're in the last times. I think that's so true, Joe. I, John, I, you know, I, I just totally agree with you there. I think on the, if you touch upon the other side there, it has more commonly expressed itself on the far left because of communism. And that's its global effect for, you know, 150 years or so. And it's still there in North Korea and in China. They're both communist parties. Uh, but also on the right, the far, and you can see that now in the far right in the US, for example, the evangelical movement is an end of days, eschological view of the world, uh, but believe in the, uh, in radical, open, vigorous capitalism and the uh, li liberalization of markets. So, I mean, that, that, this is also what John Gray says, the roots of all of this are not in postmodernism or Marx or anybody else. The roots of it are in the Christian tradition, which we still mm -hmm. find ourselves in. That's why I find Nietzsche so interesting, because he had he, he thought we, we really basically had a 2,000-year aberration caused by Christianity <laughs> and that the, it doesn't reflect human nature at all. And that we will eventually revert out of that into a more realistic view of what human nature is and how we move forward. Yeah. So just to bring that back into education, perhaps why yeah. <laughs> you know Hegel's view of education is so scary is because he believes in the perfectibility of human beings. Yes. The historicism. This is a proper, a very, very good book called "The End of Historicism," where he tackles that directly. And of course, his book. Open Society and His Enemies is mm. a very detailed attack on Hegel, Plato and others, because they, they extol this view, which is all encompassing, of course, you can't disagree with it. If you disagree with Marx, then Marx just says, well, you're just, you're just uh, behaving uh, within a class structure, therefore I can ignore you. <laughs> uh, uh, 
and that that's the problem with these universal panaceas and i feel that's true of the modern sort of expression of this you know you can't disagree with me in the cultural wars because you are a certain group and you are the oppressor well there's nothing i can ever say to deny that in your scheme but this is exactly what popper said you cannot get locked into those because you lose critical thinking you lose freedom of speech and you you actually you you lock up intellectual vigor so hold that thought because we will be going on to Marx uh, yeah. and the Marxists yes. yeah, later yeah. on in the season. And I can't wait. <music> Wilhelm von Humboldt, 1767 to 1825. Friedrich Wilhelm Christian, they all seem to have the same, same names. <laughs> yeah, Friedrich Wilhelm is, Christian Wilhelm Ferdinand von <laughs> and, and they, they seem to get more names as, as, as time goes on. Was a Prussian philosopher, linguist, government functionary, diplomat, but quite a successful diplomat, and founder of the Humboldt University of Berlin, where we're going uh, later this autumn, Donald. Yes. It was named after him in 1949. Not to be confused with his brother Alexander von Humboldt, no. famous naturalist. Ah, uh, Humboldt was born in Potsdam. Um, his father was a major in the Prussian army, rewarded for his service since in the Seven Years' War with the post of Royal Chamberlain, and some profitable state contracts came along with that. So he was from money. An early book, The Limits of State Action, which, though that's an interesting one. <laughs> Interesting title in the, in the context of what we've just been saying. <laughs> Written in his 20s, but not published till after his death, was a big influence on John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. But the specific section in that work dealing with education was published much earlier in his lifetime, pretty much straight away, under the title On Public State Education. With this publication, Humboldt took part in the philosophical debate regarding the direction of national education that was in progress in Germany as elsewhere following on from the French Revolution, which shook so much stuff up. So the Prussian king asked him to lead the Directorate of Education, and he installed a standardised system of public instruction, which became and has continued to be hugely influential. Um, you might say that he formalised the, the, the system of Prussian, the Prussian system that we're still living in. I mean, and he also founded Berlin University. All of which might seem a bit baffling when you consider that he never went to school, yeah. he was completely homeschooled, and though he went to two universities, he never took a degree. Um, right. He just kind of, you know, moved on. Um, uh, some of our kids might do that. Um, it used to be known as taking a gentleman's degree. You know, yeah. um, English aristocrats just didn't feel that it. You know, the, the person who was examining them just didn't have a right to do that. So they very often didn't hang around for a degree. So, you know, no school, no degree, and yet he founds a system of education. So, Donald, can you tell us about his educational system? Yes. Of all the people we've discussed today, Humboldt is the one who's had most direct influence on our life because he really, really did shape the schooling and higher education system, which we experience today, certainly in Europe and in, in the US, but also that has spread everywhere. You know, if you go into university, people are, it's the same old lecture halls, the same old doctorates, the same old lecturers, professors, and similarly in schools. So the, the systems are fairly homogeneous globally, and many much of it comes back to this one man, Wilhelm von Humboldt, because he basically standardized everything. And his model was, I remember, we'll go back to that point about Napoleon, uh, the Prussians had been heavily de defeated by Napoleon. We eventually, of course, beat Napoleon in 1815, but this is earlier than that. Uh, and he he looks at the he looks at the Napoleonic system actually and quite admires the standardization of Napoleon in France at the time. So they admire France, they admire Napoleon, copy him in a way, but in a very Germanic way. The military school is, and the Greeks also the, the role of of Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates and these people is immense as well, that 19th century admiration for classical learning. And that's why you get this notion of character, the Platonic idea that there is a good life and you have to mold children and point them towards living the good life. It's all about character. 
But since the, the he standardizes education and he standardizes everything. You're talking about the hours of the day, the periods, you know, that moving from one classroom to another, a set syllabus, uh, multiple subjects are taught across the day, maths, a period of English, then geography, then hi history. Uh, the rows of seats, you know, these little rows you see in classrooms, all mm -hmm. down to him. And even the bell that I remember at school, no doubt it's electronic or some other method to use now, but even that bell was uh, a Humboldtian invention to wow. signal that, you know, go to another class. Then not only that, standardizing standard textbooks, which I had at school, certainly, state exams, and even Ofsted, even the notion that you have inspectors who come in to make sure that everybody complies with this structure. All of that comes out of Humboldt in his treatise of human education. Uh, so education is again, again, it's this German idealist view. Never forget this: that you're molding or shaping the character of a student to interact with the state, uh, the world, uh, and uh, and Prussian society. People have responsibilities, you know, and you have to make sure that they they adhere to the uh, fulfilling those responsibilities towards other people personally in the state. That's still there. But the really interesting thing about the reason Humboldt is, uh, was so powerful is there's another really, another villain in, in the game here. And that's a guy called Horace Mann. Now, Horace Mann came, was an American who comes across to Prussia, uh, you know, in the mid 19th century, looks at this and goes, this is fantastic. Hops it back to the US on a boat and hey, presto, lands in Massachusetts and it persuades that state to adopt the Prussian system. And that's when it all went wrong. Because remember, all those early universities there, I went to one in New Hampshire, right next door to Massachusetts, they all adopted this system, the formal degree, the structure of a you know, bachelor's, MSc, PhD, up to lecturers, professors, all of everything really. It, lock, stock, and full double barrels we got from Humboldt, and it spread throughout the US. I remember the Americans almost uh, legislated to be to have German as their first language. It was that powerful a political uh -huh. lobby. Uh, so, and in many ways, its greatest influence has been on higher education as opposed to schooling, I suppose, because the Humboldtian model. Mm -hmm. Humboldtian model is absolute enlightenment thinking, to be fair. Uh, you know, it's about civilization, the notion of progress, you know, very individualistic, as was the British view of the enlightenment through people like Mill and Bentham and so on, but they took a different path. But again, there's one thing that really saddens me, and still to this day, because I spent my whole life, uh, you know, we've mentioned this many times in this podcast. I'm sorry to bore you again, John, with this, but what it meant was that the diminution of practical things in yeah. life, diminution. Of course, the universities love it if it's engineering or dentistry or <laughs> medicine or something, you know, because they make lots of money in that. That's a proper profession. But mm -hmm. when it comes to any other form of vocational learning, it's okay if it's teeth but not okay if it's anything else. Uh, of course, we get the abandonment, really, of the working classes in the system, and they're seen as almost cannon fodder for factories. But of course, that's no longer sustainable. And unfortunately, we may have reached a position where the Humboldtian system is, has caused such inequalities in society with this creation of this separation of oil and water separation of a graduate class mm -hmm. that we've got, it's given us real problems, which is what people like. Uh, Brian Kaplan and others have been talking and writing about for a long time. People like Roger Shank ran, ranted and railed against this, saying this system is driving us towards a cliff of social division. Uh, Kaplan, Thiel, all such people have been have been telling us this. But he is such an important person in as a in terms of his causal influence on as all as individuals in the schooling and, and higher education systems. Am I right in thinking that uh, another thing that he brings into the university system is that um, combination of teaching and research? Ah, uh, yeah, very good point. And and of course, that joining at the hip, in other words, researchers should be teachers, is the Humboldtian idea that uh, shapes higher education to this day. I personally think it's been a complete and utter disaster. If you look at the research, uh, you know, people who spend all of their life in their bedrooms getting straight A's, PhD, and so on, I very rarely have the sort of social and presentation skills that you need to be a very, very good teacher. So there's a, a weird fuel mixture in there. There's some advantages to that in terms of the experience a learner gets 
at a university, but on the whole, 40% of kids don't attend lectures because the teaching is so bad. It's a great dirty secret, but it's true uh, that teaching is, uh, on the whole, rather poor in our higher education systems. And as long as you have the two hitched together or joined at the hip like that, it will always be true. Uh, you know, I, I, I really admire secondary and primary school teachers because they get formal sort of formal training in teaching that uh, Herbert set up. But that's not true in higher education. It tends to be very spotty, very patchy, often ill-informed. And people have a, often have a very disappointing experience, they, you know, unexpectedly when they arrive at the first year. My nephew has just, uh, got, he just crapped out the first year. He was getting two lectures a week, and that was it at university. Yeah, well, students have had a terrible time over the last few years in, in general. Well, if we, I think that's right. Uh, and if, if the system had been flexible enough to, you know, really do what they had to do, and that's understand that people could learn a bit more from home rather than just zooming them to death, then perhaps yeah. that would have been a good thing. But you're right, yeah. I don't know. I have less sympathy for the, for the richer half of society, John. I, I think the other half have had it worse. <laughs> the poorer oh, yeah. people didn't go to university. Right. But, but both yeah. sides, young people in general, you're right. I agree. Before we move to summing up, um, is it just worth pointing out that he was a linguist as well, a very talented linguist, uh, much quoted by Chomsky, interestingly enough. Um, I didn't did know that. That's a really interesting study of the Basque language. And when he died was uh, doing a study of, I can't remember where it is, I think it's a, a kind of um, Far Eastern language as well. Right. And he translated Aeschylus into German. Yeah. You find that with a lot of people in the nineteenth century because they they were sort of true Europeans. They often had you know had travelled widely across Europe. Uh, David Hume, for example, uh, mm. spent a number of years in in France, and hence his uh, close acquaintanceship and ultra, ultimately disastrous relationship with Rousseau. But uh, these were very smart people, uh, yeah, who could speak several languages, including often Latin and Greek, of course. Mm. Uh, but these are the people who shaped the world we live in without us really realizing that that's where it came from. I'm not too sure many people would have even heard some of these names or realized yeah. that the system we have, the very rigid system, you know, it's when you think about it, you know, every hour, all these kids, millions of kids get up on a bell and then march to another room. <laughs> it's just slightly bizarre. Why doesn't the teacher move? Wouldn't that be easier? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I am the teacher, you are the pupil, I outrank you. Exactly. Okay. Let's and, move to lecturing. Yeah. Lecturing, you know, even that is bizarre, but you know, it's it's been absolutely fixed down for two hundred years yeah. by a guy no one's ever heard of. Something up. We can see some essential constituents of the educational system we now take as normative, um, some of us don't like at all, falling into place as a result of these thinkers. Set school days, etc. from Humboldt, character forming, formalised teacher training, discipline, yeah. role of the state, etc. Donald, how important do you think these ideas are for what comes after? I mean, in, in a way, you've already answered that. So uh, perhaps it's worth moving to, to, to beyond that. Um, to what we're going to begin to see as a dynamic that will play out in the rest of this season, the interaction between philosophy, politics, and education, yeah. an idea that education is formative of society, yeah. which, which I think comes especially strongly through in Hegel, and therefore to address whatever societal ills your particular political ideology identifies, you have to reform education in some particular way. And you know, in our own time, we, we see people like kind of Blair have a poke at university, uh, getting 50% of people into university with the, the results it had, people like Toby Young starting free schools and then realizing they weren't cut out for it at all. Sunak now, um, you know, Roback Rishi is kind of having a go, wanting to introduce yeah. new baccalaureate in Florida. You have Ron DeSantis trying to censor literature out of um, out of all conscience. It, it, it's still going on. It's been going for years. Education is a political football but football, according to the Shankly doctrine, he'd agree with Hegel, it's not a matter of life and death. It's more serious than that. Politicians take education very seriously, so they feel that they really have to mess it up. Is this yeah. 
something else that we can blame Hegel for alone, or, or, or are there other culprits? In a way, yes. You know, very interesting, you know, maybe take just one feature that we've talked about with several of these theorists, and that's the word character. When politicians start interfering with education, especially right-wing politicians, but it also occurs on the left, they often bring up this notion of character. And, you know, every older generation has its views that the world is going to the dogs. We have to bring back the golden age, which they lived through, of course, uh, the area of high character when everybody was, uh, uh, you know, very moral, very proper, and uh, everyone was hunky-dory. They, and they want to bring their views and impose it upon what they see as this feral, new, ridiculously uh, out-of-control generation. Every generation does this. But if when you start talking, when the politician starts talking about character, my heart absolutely sinks. It's, it's like... Uh, I mean, it's like Jimmy Savile taking a line on sex education, you know. He's an expert, just the wrong sort of expert. You know, he's giving you the, the equal and opposite of what you should be thinking of. So don't listen to politicians when they start interfering and they start to invent these deep roots or deep pedagogic roots for their theories because they're more often than not wrong. I mean, we've seen the results, the hideous results of the private school system in the UK on our politics. Many of our prime ministers... Uh, supposedly full of character, like Boris Johnson, uh, or Mr. Trump, who came through the Ivy League system in the States. Let's not pretend that this has been useful. I watched the documentary last night on Sam, uh, I don't know if you saw that Sam uh, Banks uh, Friedman, or whatever his name oh, is, yeah. the guy who committed the biggest fraud on the planet, who was the result of an education at MIT. His parents are professors at Stanford. These are the monsters we're creating in this system. But I think sticking to that word character for a minute in, in education, you know, the, U, the UK in the US it's very different from the UK, the way in which this Humboldtian thing is playing out. I think in the US, the character of education is often pushed by the sort of conservative religious right, as it were, mm. as against the creep of liberal values or bring back character. Bush was big on this. Huge on this, uh, G.W. Bush. In the UK, it's entirely different. It's actually Thomas Arnold, who we'll talk about in another uh, podcast. We have that planned. You know, the playing fields of Eton type thing, that notion that they, those the public schools have got it sussed, and if we just play rugger, we'll all be okay. Uh, and and look, at the, look how that has wrecked society, made the world more unequal. So whenever you hear that any department of education talk, talking about the teaching of character, some talk about teaching of character as a separate subject, then dismiss it immediately, you know, because it's interesting. There's quite a lot of evidence. I looked at the research on this Humboldtian idea of character, at the roots of it as well. And there's some very, very good pieces of research around this. There's a big schools wide program research on about 2010 that showed there were no measurable, measurable improvements in student behavior or attainment when you take this character view of the world. None at all. In fact, what you tend to uncover is the notion of character as conformity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, uh, you will conform to our social norms. You will wear a suit in a tart and kilted dress, uh, to, you know, in a public school somewhere in the middle of Africa or whatever. It's ridiculous. So it doesn't surprise me that going back to the people we looked at today, that it did in the end lead to totalitarian religious and repressive systems. In China, we still have it today. Uh, we had it with Pol Pot and Kampuchea. We have it in North Korea, but we also had it with fascism. You know, we had a 20th century that emerged copying this system that wasn't exactly the happiest time in the world with regard to war and conflict. So this attempt to have a moral code, teach a character, the state knows everything, universal schooling didn't actually work. It tended to produce hideous people who did hideous things. And mm -hmm. so, I, you know, that's why uh, I... Also, some people who did marvelous things, we should say, the balance. I think. Well, one could argue that, but marvelous things for some people. I think, to be honest, it had its heyday, and, uh, you know, when when we didn't see university as the goal for everyone in society. So everybody had to go and do a critique of Macbeth, you know, where we had some balance in the system and there were other roads in life. But we've regarded that as almost the only road in life. And that's where it's all gone wrong. And if anything, we've doubled down on the Humboldtian system, which is where it's gone wrong. Mm 
and many of the good things that were done, I, I would agree with that in terms of schooling and higher education, are now being uh, forced and forced upon everyone, universalized, as Kant would say, but they're not universally for the moral and social good, no longer are, I don't feel. It's a counterpoint to the to the theme of character. Isn't there another form of kind of um, political interference that you get with education where it's, you know, the education is seen as a servant of the state, but rather in a, in a short-term way, um, you know, they, it, it's feeding industry. You know, we need people who can do sort of maths very well. So everybody should do maths. They should stop reading Aeschylus in German and, you know, and, and, and doing all these other things. Education really has to just give us the workforce that the state needs. I mean, it, it seems to me that's similarly kind of influenced by the Hegelian idea, but in a much narrower, short-term, rather myopic sort of way, don't you think? Well, I think very opposite to you, Andrew. Education always has this sort of silver bullet thing. It used to, it was, you know, the number of times I've heard parents in the area I live in thinking that Latin is the silver bullet for their kids. They very proudly tell me how their kids are getting Latin at school. You go, are you kidding me? A language nobody speaks? What are you thinking? And of course, let's not pretend that the teaching of Latin, which is still unbelievably common in schools in the UK, has anything else, has anything to do with industry or commerce or capitalism. It's the very opposite. And the same is true of the maths baccalaureate type thing. You might think that is to do with it being an instrumental subject. It's not really. Actually, at the heart, people wrongly believe that these things are to do with transferable skills. In other words, if I get good at maths, I'll be really good at thinking. Uh, that's not true either, actually. You know, the last person I would go to to pro solve a problem in my life is a maths professor, you know. Uh, so I, I think we always have this view of education as fundamentally Prussian, Humboldtian, where vocational skills don't really matter. Actually, if we just teach them these core things like Latin, I remember when it was Japanese one time, that was bizarre. Uh, Latin, whatever the current fad is, now it's mathematics, you're right. The ridiculous idea that everybody has to learn mathematics up to 18, it's truly absurd, uh, especially in an age where coding and a lot of mathematics will be automated. <laughs> uh, then you can see how the influence of Humboldt and the German idealists is still alive and kicking with us. But it comes through the people who rule us, our politicians. They're all a graduate class. They all believe that, going back to something I said earlier, they all believe that they came through a golden age and that people should be taught as they were in that context. That's the big mistake. And then everybody else doesn't really have a voice. The poor people who didn't, don't go through that system, which is the majority of people in society, don't really have a voice on this. Uh, and therefore, we don't get any real reform in the system. It comes down to credentials signaling. I mean, why are universities obsessed? Then you know this AI stuff that I'm wholly absorbed with. The university's reaction to AI was, oh, but kids can cheat in essays. They're so obsessed by exams and credentials. It was blockchain a couple of years ago. Oh yeah, blockchain. Why do you want blockchain? A million products launched uh, and grants and research around locking down credentials in blockchain. Because that's really what their fundamental control mechanism is, the handing out of degrees, the signaling that Kaplan refers to, which he thinks 80% of the money is spent on. So I'm not, I'm not wholly convinced that education has been geared up towards industry at all. I think education should be for life and living, the production of autonomous people who can also get reasonable jobs. There's nothing wrong with that view of the world, in my view. Uh, you know, that's why working class people don't really have, don't necessarily want to send their kids to university because they think their kids may have a happier life, having a reasonable job, bringing up their families and being stable in life. Uh, but I think we have this Humboldtian view that everybody has to go to college. And if you haven't read Shakespeare, you're an inferior being. <laughs> hmm. uh, and that's not my experience of life. Hey, we always end up with be... this, don't we? We always end up with this weird, weird politicking. <laughs> yes. Education should be for life and living. I think that's a yeah. good little sound bite to end on. Yeah. Thank you very much, Donald. It's okay, very, John. Thank you very quite much. A canter through some difficult stuff. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, John. Great Minds on Learning comes from the Learning Hack team and is produced by John Helmer. Sound edit is by Isaac Peacock. Social media by Jay Curtis. Graphics by David O'Connor. 
The podcast is based on a series of blog posts written by Donald Clark and we'd like to thank Donald for his kind collaboration in this project. If you're a fan of these podcasts and want to support us and get exclusive member benefits, go to patreon.com forward slash learning hack.